today's bike check, as you might notice, is something very unusual right in front of me. This is known as a slingshot. This is the team issue frame. As you can probably work out, it's very different to most modern frames, i.e. it's got a cable instead of a down tube. Let's have a closer look, shall we? This bike is known as the Slingshot, and the reason for that, quite simply, before we get into details, are the fact it's got a cable down tube which helps ricochet the bike along the trail. But as with any peculiar design, there's obviously a story of how it got to this in the first place. And designer Mike Groendahl was actually surfing the pits around on his little mini moto bike at a moto race. And this bike in question he was riding actually had a crack on the down tube, allowing the bike to actually sort of crab along a bit. And he noticed that not only was it very comfortable, but it actually gave it a bit of a lurch when he rode, when the bike would sort of compress and extend back together. So he took that concept to the bicycle and came up with this design, which was actually used on other styles of bike as well, including racing bicycles that you'd see on the road. But on a mountain bike at the time, bearing in mind the suspension would have been brand new. We're talking like the 94, 95 era. This thing came out and is radically different to anything else. It's made from 4130 chromoly, true temper chromoly, very strong, very durable. And instead of having a down tube, it has a cable. And on the top tube, it has a lump of fiberglass here. Uh, rumor has it, this is some sort of leaf spring from a Corvette. Um, not quite sure on those facts, but nonetheless, it is very interesting. And the whole concept of this was your bike could hit an obstacle the front end would compress and the cable would ricochet and pull it back in alignment. So it actually enables a bike to walk its way along the trail. Um, fascinating, terrifying, freaky, all of the above. I think I kind of love it though. Now you have to bear in mind that this frame was on the market available and it had a rigid fork on it. This one here actually has a Pace RC36 on there. Um, but when this came out, having a rigid fork on it, it enabled it to have an element of comfort that wasn't currently available on the mountain bike scene. And the early adopters that rode this bike actually really, really loved it. Once they'd got past the terrifying fact that the whole front triangle was almost disconnected. It would move side to side. It would move in every direction pretty much. And it was held together essentially by that cable. Can you imagine riding a bike today where the front triangle is actually designed to flex? You think that everything we have on modern mountain bikes, the front triangle has to be very stiff. Other parts of the bike will flex, but it needs to be stiff in order for the bike to actually maintain traction and everything it's supposed to do. This did the complete opposite. Absolutely bonkers. Now up to the cockpit part of the bike, and first up, you're gonna notice it looks very different to what we ride these days. These days, we don't tend to have bar ends, we tend to have much wider bars, up to 800 millimeters wide, and a very short stem. So these have a one-piece bar on here. Well, I say one piece, they're actually welded, but they're not separate parts. The bar ends are incorporated into the bar design. However, the bar design is frankly terrifying. The titanium, I believe they're made by a brand called Titec, and they're actually two-piece. In the stem here, it has a socket with a wall bearing, and basically the bars actually slot together, and you have a shim over the top that holds that join. Would anyone in their right mind now run a two-piece bar like this? I think it's insane, but you think of the tech from back in the 90s, and on a tape measure, they're coming in at um, a whopping uh, 570 millimeters, a bit different to the 800s we'd run today. And you think you have to cram into this, two sets of gear shifters and your brake levers. Everything is extremely compact in here. Stem length is, well, the stem is a synchro stem and it's about 120, 120 mil. And I'd say the rise on that is, it's about a 30 degree rise on there. So quite an angle on that. If you consider that most stems we have these days are zero degree or zero rise. Really nice stem design. It's actually got a bit of a hinge on this. It's held together with Allen bolts and underneath, as opposed to having a regular faceplate with four or three bolts. Um, these stems were everywhere at the time. And when the A-head system came out, they're one of the first ones to have what we called a knee saver back then. Early A-head stems, that is where the stem clamps onto the steerer tube, used to have a twin pinch bolt on the back. And on your bikes back then, like this, were a lot shorter, you used to catch your knees on them sometimes. So pretty horrible design. This is one of the first ones to actually have this incorporated on the inside. Not only did it look really neat, but it did crucially save your knees. Also just notice it's got a classic Chris King no thread set on the underneath. 
Uh, the grips on here, uh, actually these are perished, they're actually quite hard rubber, but I do remember these from back in the day, these are surface grips. They used to be very soft actually, but they're not lock-on, so you would have had hairspray or paint or anything possible just to get them on to stick. Hairspray, of course, is what most people used to use because it's essentially a minor lacquer or a minor glue. Brake levers though, now these are something special. These are Ultec brake levers and I've never seen these in the flesh. I only ever saw these in the magazines that I grew up reading. Now these were retrofit levers for Magura HS33 and HS11 and HS22 brakes. Now these are ultra trick. Look, just look at the quality of these things, like full CNC machined aftermarket levers for what was already an aftermarket product. Pretty, pretty, pretty cool piece of tech. And there's also a set of XTR rapid fire shifters just neatly stashed under the bars here. And I've got to say, they still look just as good now as they used to back then. Okay, so now let's check out the front fork on the bike. Now this might look familiar to you because we have an RC35 made by Pace hanging up on the GMBN Tech set. This is a later fork, this is the 36 and it's the Evo. It actually has a twin brace on it, one front and one rear. And Pace were quite famous for this and having the brakes on the back of the fork which actually, in the early days, really did feel like it helped with braking power. As you might notice, the fork is quite short compared to a lot of forks we have today, but it's running about 80 millimeters of travel, and it's got a tie-coated stanchions on them as well, so it's a super high-end fork with those carbon lowers, and it had springs and elastomer rubber on the inside, but it didn't have any sort of damper like we have on even basic forks today. Yet somehow, they still feel quite good, surprisingly good, in fact. Mounted on the back there is a Magura HS22, as I said, mated up to those Ultec brake levers. And yes, it's a 26 inch wheel bike, of course. So what did you have in the day? You clearly had to have Mavic rims. So these are Mavic 117 SUPs, and the SUP rim was one of the first rims on the market. It was pinned, it was welded, and then it was machined down, so it had a perfectly smooth join. Mavic really did make the best stuff back then. Of course, everyone else has started to catch up but Mavic really hold a bit of a place in my heart, I think. And this particular rim had the ceramic coating, so it was a super expensive one. It gave you better braking traction on the sidewalls of the rims there. Something just to note a little close in detail is the brake pads are not stock on these Magura HS22s. They're actually the Scott Matthauser pads in the orange color. They were super soft compound, which mated with that ceramic coating on the rim really did give for exceptional braking power if you consider this is pre-disc brake era. Tires on here, well, they're a bit more uncommon than what you'd expect on a gravel bike these days. They're 26 by 1.5 and they're specialized hard packs. Well, I've got to say, the tread pattern on them looks pretty modern. If you turn that to a 2.5, that'd be pretty good on a bike of today. And a final little touch on those wheels is the WTB grease guard hubs. Back in the day of using cup and cones before we used cartridge bearings on everything, you could keep your hubs going a bit longer by injecting grease directly into the grease port and purging out all of that old muck. And out to the back of the bike, again, it's a 26 inch wheel running on those WTB grease guard hubs. The hubs though are quite interesting because this was pre-cassette design. There's actually a bit of a, a bit of a custom cassette going on here. So it's a screw on block, but an eight speed block, and it still uses a hyperglide, which of course comes from the non screw on style, cassette style that we're familiar with today. Uh, lock ring on the bottom there. That's pretty cool to see. Rims, again, Mavic SUP 117 ceramics on there. Again, with another one of these old specialized hard pack 26 by 1.5 tires. Uh, they're quite perished, but it's really nice to still see them on the bike. Brakes out back, again, another Magura HS22 with a Scott Matthauser soft compound pads. Although on this one, it's actually got a brake booster on here. They were there essentially because the brakes were so powerful, they actually forced the seat stays of the bike apart as you braked. So they'd have the brace there to actually help keep those cantilevers back in place to make sure that braking power went through to the rim. Pretty cool, actually. Gearing on here, Shimano XCR. You've got a triple on the front with a 24, 36, and a 48 tooth chainring. Uh, the beautiful looking Shimano XCR crank there, of course, and that front derailleur, which are pretty much non existent by today's standards. And out back, the classic grey XTR derailleur. Still looks just as good. Okay, and finishing touches include a WTB saddle up on the top here. They're still making really good saddles today, so you should definitely check out their saddles. Uh, the seat post is a Syncros number, and the quick release on here is actually made by Salsa, the same front and rear actually. 
And the last little touch that I absolutely love is one of the early crud catchers with a custom mount so it can actually fit around the, the wire down tube on here. I think this bike is like actually an amazing piece of tech considering what everyone else was doing back in the day, but uh, pretty terrifying at the same time. If you want to see a couple more interesting bikes, click down here to see the Foes LTS. That was one of the first long travel bikes available on the market. And click on down here if you want to see some really freaky bikes. This one does make a brief appearance, but there's a lot of other weird tech in there. As always, don't forget to give us a thumbs up here at GMBN Tech, hit subscribe, and don't forget, hit that notification bell.